It's tiny, almost invisible, one of the most dangerous creatures on Earth. Just wait till you see the havoc it causes. And this little monster is one of ours, a jellyfish called Irukandji that spends the summer months in the warm tropical waters up north. Now, if that word Irukandji means nothing to you, you're not alone. Not only is this the most venomous Aussie of them all, it's one of those great scientific mysteries. It's also one of our best kept secrets. Hardly a tourist attraction, and certainly not the kind the tourist industry wants to see on national television. Get on over my skills. Uh, like, um, pains in my stomach and my back is really hurting. My arm is killing me, both my arms. Therese Corette is going through unbelievable pain. Oh, it's just can't see why. It's just, uh, pain beyond the reach of any drug. <laughs> She's been poisoned by Australia's oh. least known but most venomous creature. Oh. My face, I just want to rip my skin. It's driving me nuts. It's the Irukandji jellyfish. So small, it's almost invisible. But within its tail, a toxin that can kill. It's incredibly powerful. What it does to the human body is unbelievable. To somebody watching it, you just can't imagine that the body can survive going through that. Irukandji were first discovered in Australia's tropical north more than 50 years ago. But remarkably, it's only now that their deadly potential is being understood. They're tiny, about the size of a fingernail, and they're equipped with a lethal sting. I don't think that he even saw what hit him. I mean, they're so small, and they're almost invisible in the water. It was Easter Sunday two years ago, and American businessman Robert King was fulfilling a lifelong dream, snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef. But within minutes of jumping into the waters off Opal Reef, he was stung by an Irukandji. In incredible pain, Robert was rushed to Townsville Hospital. His blood pressure so high that he suffered a brain hemorrhage. By the time his partner, Michelle Carlson, arrived in Australia, Robert was in a coma. Michelle spent the next two weeks by his side but Robert never regained consciousness. By 1.30, they had done the last CAT scan they did, an MRI, and um, his brain had stopped functioning. I didn't want that, that death to go in vain. I wanted, um, I wanted it to stand for something. I didn't think that more people should die from a jellyfish that nobody knew about. Robert King was the second confirmed death from Irukandji poisoning in Australia. But scientists believe the real figure is higher. This, after all, is one of the world's most toxic species. You've got your range of nasties. You've got your spiders and snakes and your, your death adders and your taipans and your funnel webs and all these nasties. And the box jelly is at the top of the heap of the nasties. It's incredibly, incredibly venomous. The irukandji, it's way up there. It's so far up above. It kicks the box jelly's butt. Marine biologist Lisa Gershwin has been studying the Irukandji for the past six years. They have well-developed eyes with lenses and retinas and corneas, and we know experimentally that they can see, but they have no brain. And that just blows my mind. I, I don't understand how they do that, but I'm fascinated by it. Because we know so little about the Irukandji, Lisa fears cases of death or injury are going undiagnosed. It mimics a heart attack, it mimics maybe a stroke, um, it mimics all kinds of things and it doesn't leave a mark on the body. So the chances for diagnosing an Irukandji-related death 
are very slim. I think we all do recognize that it's very likely there have been more deaths. That have been put down to heart attacks, strokes. Absolutely. Or absolutely. drowning. Or drowning, yeah, absolutely. The problem that we've got with Irukandji syndrome is that there's probably at least half a dozen species of animal that can cause it. We don't even know what they are yet and we don't know how similar their venoms are. So the question is, what do you actually create your antivenom to? Dr Paul Cullen is a trauma specialist based in Cairns. He says just as scientists struggle to understand the Urukanji, doctors find it very difficult to treat its victims. I, I have many memories of people coming in in severe pain and greatly distressed, and I think that's, that's the image that sticks in your mind. Um, and it's pain that it's very difficult to control. How many victims do you treat a year? That's one of the very interesting things about it. it. It varies a lot and it ranges from about 30 up to um, a peak of 120, or almost 120, which is what we saw a couple of years ago, which is the worst ever season that we've seen. From Broome to Bundaberg, they inhabit the seductive waters of our tropical north. Australia's tourist playground brings in big money and that makes the Yurikanji a very sensitive issue. Don't touch me. With a net. <laughs> With netting offering little protection, lifeguards regularly sweep some of our most popular beaches. Here's a whole bunch in there. Here's more, here's another. Closing them in the middle of summer, sometimes for weeks at a time. Amazing, isn't it? Something that small will make you sick. In the few days that I've been up here, so many people have told me that I have more chance of being killed in a car crash heading to the beach than I do by an Irukandji. Now that's absolutely true. But this is more than a debate about public health. It's about money, big money. Authorities estimate that after the two confirmed deaths, tourism in far north Queensland lost $65 million. Little wonder then that stingers are such a touchy subject. We've been down here working on the beaches filming and um, also doing research on them and I had local tourist operators, owners of apartments and stuff like that come down and physically abuse us for, you know, you guys are scaring tourists away from it, get out of here, you know, go, to, go somewhere else. You know, Richard Fitzpatrick has own. faced more than the hostility of local tourist operators. He's a scientist and while researching the jellyfish, Richard has felt the pain of an Irukandji sting. To me, the symptoms I had was like a, a cricket bat bashing against your back against your kidneys constantly and then having a hot knife randomly jabbed throughout your body. Richard and, Fitzpatrick um, was lucky. Yeah, he recovered surreal. quickly, but not so his colleagues Jamie Seymour and Therese Corret. The only place in the body that was uncovered was just around my lips out the side, just you duck dive from the surface and caught one right across the top, right across the, the face through here. They too were the scientists at the forefront of Irukandji research in Australia. Your face is driving me nuts. Pain's starting to come back again. Overall pain. They know all the dangers, they take all the precautions, but even the professionals get stuck. Richard was there to film them as they struggled to cope with the Urukandji toxin. You know, watching Jamie and Teresa in, in hospital that night it was just absolutely frightening. I mean, Jamie was bad, but Teresa was really bad. And, you know, they had pumped her full of morphine as much as she could possibly handle. And, um, and like, the pain just wasn't dropping. It just wasn't taking the edge off the pain. And, I mean, that was almost, that was over 24 hours, almost 48 hours she was like that. And, like, it was really frightening because you've got the doctors there and everyone, like, no one knew what to do with it. Oh, and the politics surrounding Irukandji can be just as poisonous as its sting. Jamie Seymour agreed to speak to 60 Minutes, but at the last minute he pulled out, saying the issue was so sensitive that talking could cost him scarce research dollars and possibly his job. Are you frightened of these little creatures? I am. I, I respect them very much. Yeah, Lisa Gershwin has offered to take me on one of her research it trips is, is. Um, and show me where the Irukandji jellyfish as, live. Uh, we just have to make sure that every possible place that an Irukandji can possibly get in contact with your skin uh, is sealed up. All it takes is just a touch of venom and it makes you bloody sick and as we know it can kill. This pest is at its worst when the weather is at its best. 
clear skies, smooth seas, a light northerly breeze. Conditions that scientists say draw the Yurikanji closer to the coast. How many Irukandjis do you think are out there? Uh, there's at least seven that I'm confident are Irukandji producing species. Um, of those, this one, uh, Kirikia barnsai, is the only one that's currently named and classified. These other six, we know nothing about them. They don't even have names yet. Back in her Townsville lab, Lisa is now building a collection of Irukandji, slowly piecing together vital information. It's expensive work that attracts little funding, but she's being helped by an unlikely donor, Michelle Carlson, the partner of Robert King. I wanted to raise money so, so that I could support that research, so that more people wouldn't be killed, um, you know, that more people wouldn't die. Lisa Gershwin believes she's discovered the particular species of Irukandji that killed Robert. The way that we came to that conclusion was in matching up the stinging cells that were retrieved from Bob's clothing. But more important for Michelle is the knowledge that his death helped save others. Bob was an organ donor, and so he actually saved four, four lives um, here in Australia. And, you know, to me, he's a hero. Um, to me, even in his death, he was still caring about people. In his memory, Michelle Carlson has given more than $15,000 to researching the Irukandji. A not insignificant amount, considering that Australia's total research funding for this deadly jellyfish is just half a million dollars. And that, say the people who know best, is simply not good enough. It's not about banging drums for more money. It's about protecting people from dying. It's about protecting people from suffering uh, uh, the pain and the illness that comes with it. That's really terrible. We don't know anything about their ecology. We don't know anything about their venoms. We don't know how they reproduce. We don't know anything about them. Do you subscribe to this argument that yes, there's only been two documented deaths from Irukandji syndrome? But have there been more that have been put down to other causes? I believe there have been more. I think most of us working with Irukandjis do believe there have been more. Denying it isn't going to change the fact. Irukandji is real. Irukandji can kill people. We've got to get it right, and we've got to get it right soon. Hello, I'm Tom Steinford. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au as well as the 9now app.